Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced by North Idaho College located on Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guests. Our topic for today's program is the use of chaplains in the juvenile justice system. Uh, many of us uh, in the communities are not aware of all the different services and programs that exist in our judicial systems. and. Today, this will be our particular area of, of the judicial system we'll talk about. And we're so pleased to welcome to the program Chaplain Jeff Cheeseborough, who is, as I've indicated, a chaplain of the Kootenai County Juvenile Justice Services in uh, the state of Idaho in our county. Jeff, welcome to the program. It's nice of you to take time to be with us and to inform our viewers, not only in Idaho, but across the Northwest, uh, the kind of role that you and others and other systems provide. Again, welcome to the program. Well, thank you for having me here. And I'm pleased, as always, to have our regular panelist, Janelle Burke, who's an attorney in the state of Idaho, and it's very appropriate. As an attorney who works uh, as a clerk with the judge that she's with us, she'll certainly be our expert uh, panelist. And with that, we'll ask Janelle to commence today's questioning. Welcome to the program, Chaplain. You are working with a particular segment of the population, but can you tell us what does a chaplain do and what does a chaplain not do? <laughs> Well, I can't speak for other chaplains so much. Um, my role in the justice system uh, has been to be available, accessible, and responsive to the needs of the justice system um, in regards to the youth and their families, as well as the staff at times, uh, to facilitate religious services primarily at our district uh, juvenile detention center. Now, does someone call you? Um, and who usually calls you? Probably, obviously, not the person incarcerated or the y young juvenile uh, who's detained. No, um, I have regularly scheduled um, uh, group, interactive discussion groups at the detention center, and um, kids ask voluntarily to speak to me at times, so we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one interaction. Uh, the groups are all voluntarily attended. Um, we have over a 90% attendance rate, so, you know, in lieu of sitting in their cell, they come out to my groups, but uh, they quickly uh, find that they're very interesting and, and uh, they get very involved and they're, they're wonderful sessions to uh, facilitate. Now what does a chaplain not do? What are some of the things you probably wouldn't do? Hmm, good question. Well, um, in the nine years that I've been in the community here, um, I've gotten to be known through the youth groups and, and with the different agencies that help uh, young people and families. And as I've served as the chaplain for Kootenai County Justice Services here in the last five years, um, you get known by different agencies, health and welfare, CASA, uh, police department, sheriff's department, etc. And so from time to time, uh, I get called and asked to, to help with different uh, incidents or um, uh, involvements with family and children in a variety of settings for a variety of reasons. So I'm kind of like uh, a uh, youth pastor at large. But in follow up on Janelle's question, but there are some things you don't do. You're, well, you've been talking about the things that you're willing yeah. to how you're willing to serve. And what I don't do, I've chosen personally not to get involved in, and that is marrying. Until recently, burying. Um, uh, you, no, or you not conducting weddings or right. funerals. No, no, I don't do that. Although I have a young lady right now that I've come to know and. Uh, and to cherish, and her family has asked me to help with, um, with her funeral um, as um, she's looking at um, dealing with that whole issue right now. So I, I don't know what she's terminally ill. Yes, she is. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, to be a chaplain, how about background? Uh, you, you need to be a religious leader, is that correct? Or, or do you have to have certain training in theology or religion? Well, um, in my role with Kootenai County um, five years ago, uh, I I um, work with the county commissioners and with uh, Al Friesen, who uh, oversees the juvenile justice services here in Kootenai County, to uh, put together a contract and an agreement by which um, um, one of the requirements was that I needed to be an ordained uh, minister to have uh, just the proper amount of liability insurance personal uh, coverage, and, um, and then to meet with the agreements of the contract that we set up uh, in order to provide services. And to my knowledge, I'm the only juvenile chaplain in the state. 
Yeah. And you are an ordained minister. Yes. I would assume one of the reasons to be an ordained minister or a priest or a rabbi uh, or you know, religious leader in any of the different uh, religions would be that, that you would speak at times in confidence mm -hmm. and just like uh, an attorney and others, then that's a privileged conversation. Yes, it is. And it's protected by law. Yes. I let young people know that, for the most part, uh, my role at the detention center um, serves as a very personal um, uh, relationship. Uh, I, I also let them know that my goal is to reconcile them to their families, um, back into the community, and to restore them to a healthy place where they can be uh, productive, healthy citizens. So there's a lot of different issues that come up. but. Yes, when they, when they do divulge certain things, uh, sexual abuse, physical abuse, uh, suicidal tendencies, or, uh, and at times criminal behavior. You know, I let them know, I don't want to hear a whole lot about that because this is something I've agreed with Kootenai County Justice Services to, uh, to divulge also because they need to be held accountable and we need to have a safe community. Now, I have to back up, I'm a little confused because <laughs> there is, like, Catholic priests are a good example of this, where there's confession before a priest and uh, they have a vow not to uh, reveal that. So in your case, even though you're an ordained minister, do I hear you saying that, that young people, they can or cannot talk to you in confidence? And, uh, in other words, do you, or under the contract, have an obligation to reveal that, or do you have an obligation as a minister uh, to keep that confidence in, in the, those conversations? As a minister, yes, I do, within, the, within the, my role with the county justice at the detention center, when those things are divulged to me, I have an obligation because of my personal agreement with the county to divulge those things. But what I, how I get around that, uh, I preface, prefer, preference, preface all my discussions with young people, letting them know that, that uh, don't tell me about criminal activity. So you do have a different role because, uh, than say a priest would, because and of course a priest is working at, with their parish and, uh, or, or others, I, I gave that as an example, but uh, so you don't have that ability to to have a, a a person to speak to you in the same kind of confidence they would with, because of your contract with the county. Right, I would say so. So that limits some of the conversations that you could have with them to some in the degree. form of a confession. Mm -hmm. To some degree. What I found though, for the most part, young people want help in processing their behavior. And so quite often that, that doesn't, it's never really been an issue because they, they want accountability. They, they want to learn how to get beyond what it is they did that they're ashamed of. Okay. Janelle Burke. You talked a little bit about the fact that you do some group sessions, but do you also do individual counseling as well? Yes, uh, I wouldn't so much as say that it's counseling, but it is um, quite, quite a bit. In fact, I average probably about 15 one-on-one -on -one sessions a week. So you talk quite a bit with these young folks. Can you give us just an example of how, per, how a young person might work through a problem? You don't have to use names, but just, just an example of how a young person might work through a problem. They're having problems at home. They get committed. Um, maybe they're having problems in their school community and in the community as lar at large as well. Mm -hmm. and, and how do they kind of work through those problems? Well, how what can I, you be of help? Sure. What I found is that um, a lot of the young people I work with um, are not very good at interactive discussions or interpersonal uh, relationships with adults. And so um, part of my effort is to establish rapport. Um, I utilize humor quite a bit as well as just being real and relevant as to the issues that, that are impacting their lives. And um, I found young people to be very, you know, um, uh, refreshed to find that here's an adult who can talk about these things, whereas uh, they, they don't have that quite often in their families or, or anywhere else. And so you open up that door and here they come. They want to know all kinds of things. How do, how do I identify uh, how I feel, how to put a name to it? So. And, and you're also offering them support at the same time, support for a different road of conduct. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, when, I, when I look at a young person, I see someone who, with tremendous potential. Um, I try to identify their strengths and envision who they could become once they get past some of these obstacles and problems uh, that they're in their lives. And they appreciate that. So in other words, you sort of perform some ethical kind of sounding board for these young people. Yes. Uh, 
their questions are as numerous as you can imagine. And uh, most of them are, uh, surround ethical, moral, spiritual um, dilemmas. topics and dilemmas, yeah. Mm -hmm. That these young people have. Mm -hmm. And, and in, in, in their families, they may not be receiving much support or even there might not even be much conversation about these ethical dilemmas. Exactly. Quite often I find that um, they've never had discussions concerning many of the topics that they bring up. So they're very inquisitive and they find uh, our groups to be very safe and open and encouraging in, in asking good questions. Are you shocked sometimes? Rarely. Rarely shocked, no. Um, I'm surprised at um, how little opportunity they've, they've had to interact with adults or to, um, to um, work through their, pro their problems or their dilemmas. Um, it seems that we do not pursue young people enough individually to give them that comfort and that safety. So I, that shocks me sometimes. I like Janelle. <clears throat> I'm not asking for any, obviously, um, violation of privacy. That's essential that we not identify persons on the program in a case like this. But as she's indicated to you, I think one thing to be helpful to our viewers is to find out more about the characteristics of what may lead young people into uh, a problem where they're in the justice system. You have already alluded to that in relation to the family. Can you give us a little more profile of the type of family that the great majority of them come from? Uh, when you talk about communication being a problem with adults, do they not have good rapport in many cases with their parents or grandparents or others around them? If you just take time with your expertise and background, uh, compare the, uh, and, 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 you know, there's always exceptions to everything, but the average family that the, the, these young people come from con contrasted with families where young people are not in the justice system. Hmm, do, you see, do you see a contrast there? Well, uh, no. You don't? Uh, no, it's, yeah. it's interesting. Um, yes, I agree that there is a, um, generally speaking, a profile to, to some extent with maybe a majority of the kids in that they have not been guided or shown how to um, grow and how to develop how to be a woman, how to be a man, you know, following mom or dad. But the spectrum of kids we get into the system, some of them come from very prominent, uh, influential, healthy families. Um, what I find is that there's a certain point in our society where young people become peer dependent and less so involved and in valuing the family. So a transition away from the family in more and more following the thinking process and pattern of their peers. Happens at too early a stage. When you, you say know? too early, about what age on a common do you see this happening? Oh, 11, 12 years old, quite often. Um, and, and then the prevalence of, uh, of drugs, you know, and alternative lifestyles that, uh, that are exemplified by media and by older peers where it's acceptable, you know, to party, to drink, to get high. Um, it it, it um, is frighteningly prevalent um, in our country, but in, in the District 1 in Kootenai County, as you've seen with the meth issue and, and um, others. You've been informative by indicating that one of the problems, even if they, no matter what type of family they've grown up in, that it's the moving away from closeness to the parents or the family to their peer group. Maybe I can follow up with this approach. Uh, the great majority of juveniles that you work with in the system, are they tending to be drawn to a particular type of peer group? I mean, out there, there's obviously different peer groups. There, there are young people that never drink and so forth and other groups that do. So is there a profile there of the kind of peer groups that they're in? Well, yeah, I, I, I work a lot with um, leadership type youth. Um, and I find a common denominator. We all want to be accepted. We want to belong. We want to be loved. Um, we also want to love well. And that's a topic that the, the kids always want to have a discussion about. Well, how do you grow a relationship? How do you make friends? How do you qualify that? And um, young people are out there looking to belong and be part of something that's fun, accepted, uh, that uh, is entertaining. Um, and, and so a lot of times that involves alcohol and drugs and, 
and they, they get swept up into it, and it, it grabs them, grabs their soul, grabs their heart, and um, they get carried away pretty fast. So out of that great desire to be accepted and loved, um, sometimes they may be drawn to a group that will do that for them, but it's an, an unhealthy environment? Yes, very fast. Janelle very Burke. Fast. I know we're going to have some parents and grandparents out there who are watching. They're going to say, here's a gentleman who has a lot of experience with young people. What advice do you have for them with their young people? What, what would you say is important as we're growing healthy families? Well, more than anything, it's, um, you know, parents need to look at themselves and their own honest issues in how they relate with their children, to love them, to communicate, to listen, uh, to try to understand before they demand to be understood. Um, as young people more and more in our society grow up, they're looking to be set free, to run on their own, to have be confident. But too often, uh, they don't feel confident. They don't know how this changing world will, you know, greet them, well, what they will do with them, how they will be valued. So more than anything, we need to fight for, I say, the souls of our children by relating to them well, loving them as best we can. So emotional deprivation is very bad. Yes, very much so. So you want to keep contact with your young person, a lot of contact with that young person. I like the Go commercials. Go places with it. Exactly. I like these commercials coming out there. They talk about, uh, you know, because I ask every day. Well, you know, there's a fine line to being intrusive and barging in on their privacy. But there's also that message that the young people hear that mom and dad care enough to, to set parameters. This is yes, this is no. Now let me tell you how free you can be within that. And, and parents themselves need to be good role models, good, good examples, is that correct? Yes, that's probably one of the bigger problems we have with our kids is fewer and fewer uh, adult role models they can identify with, especially men. Uh, there's tremendous uh, lack of, of uh, male leadership in our, in our culture. Maybe that may be ingrained in the culture. Women are uh, more encouraged from a uh, young child to be more communicative about their feelings, and young men are taught more to be withdrawn is yes that's true well you know you see that quickly referenced with uh, uh, movies oh you know it's a relational movie it's a chick flick well I'm like, I like chick flicks that doesn't make me a chick you know um, but yeah but that's one of the things with the guys as well as the girls in our groups and we do gender specific we separate them for the most part although occasionally we do co-ed but uh, they find it very refreshing for a man to talk about feelings and being open to uh, passion and, and to uh, conflict and, and how you deal with those relationally. Uh, young men, I would assume when you have those sessions, if it's an all-male session, are more likely to uh, open up than, than when they're in the co-ed. Uh, yeah. When they're around young women, they're less likely to express themselves. Is that correct? Oh, for sure. Yes. And that's why I try not to do too many co-ed because there's just too many sexual tensions for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. After young men learn to open up in some ways, then does it make sense to then have a co-ed session where they, after they've done that, where they could maybe the, communicating with the other gender is also very important. And that works out that way sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't, but um, I know that once they've experienced some confidence in talking openly amongst young men uh, and with men that I bring in as volunteers, they, they do communicate better with, with the girls and with ladies. There's some outstanding academicians who have written a lot about communications, and there's a number of communication models, uh, ideal models, and we talk about input and output and feedback and on the academic level, and then there's a list of uh, great roadblocks or obstacles to uh, hinder communication. For example, one of them is that one chooses their own medium. You know, you might speak to someone in French and they don't speak French, that's an example. Yeah. Uh, but based on all that, I saw an interview not long before her death with Mother Teresa, a couple of years or three years before her death, and she was asked what was the number one problem in the world, and I thought she'd say poverty or, or uh, illness, because she had dedicated herself to that, but she said no, it was loneliness. So mm. in, with working with youth, and I think you've alluded to that some today, is if there is a lack of communication with adults as parents or teachers, whomever it may be, uh, how would you react to Mother Teresa's statement, and do you find any young people up? A detachment and a loneliness? Very much so. Uh, I think that's the biggest problem we have in the educational system, uh, in the community in general, and in the family. Um, to make a connection, um, 
is, is important. Who cares about my life? Am I alone in this? Um, who will rescue me from quite often the depravity that has Im impacted me? Most of the young people involved in the justice system are victims, victims of adult abuse and neglect and abandonment. Um, that's why I embrace Idaho's justice system in that the focus within Idaho um, statewide is restorative justice. How can we restore the criminal victims to a safer community? How can we restore um, the young people who have committed the crimes? Um, how can we build a stronger community where there's more peace? In order to do that, you have to communicate well. And to me, that means in including the young people, the community, and the victims all together in restoring that health. But that takes, you know, really caring. And I find that to be a difficult issue in our society. But we do have that focus. I know in your work, like in the other work, that there's not a 100% receptive uh, cooperation. I mean, there's, there's young people that you work with that you have more success with than others. Mm -hmm. They're more willing. Uh, would you take a minute to tell us about the more difficult, challenging cases? What keeps them from coming forth and dealing with some of the ethical questions? Or are, are, are they at times back off? Or are the, those that are, you might call the most challenging or are hardened with what's already happened to them? Is there a profile there? Or is there certain kinds of things that happen to young people that makes it much more difficult to reach them hmm. than other young people? Well, trust is a primary issue. Um, several young ladies I've worked with in the past, and a few young men, um, find it almost impossible to trust anymore because of the abuse that's been, uh, you know, done to them. And so that is a really difficult issue. But in exploring their feelings and their struggles, um, they look forward to the groups that the county facilitates. Um, by, by uh, bringing me in and the different people I bring in. In order to be resilient, they need to look at the issue of trust. Otherwise, the loneliness over is overwhelming. The other part of it, I think, is the probably biggest struggle is the drug addiction, and especially methamphetamines. I watch young people walk to the doors, and I haven't seen them for a few months, and my goodness, they've lost 30, 40 pounds. And within a few days, you know, they're requesting to talk to me, um, uh, if not within the first 24 hours. And, and the thing that's amazed me in the last couple of years is how they're requesting that I help them confess to their probation officer they can't break this addiction and it's killing them and they don't know how to deal with that. But, um, you know, generally speaking, I think that the lack of trust is, is really a difficult issue. One final point and then back to Janelle, and that is we've had some rather famous people in Hollywood uh, who've lost their children uh, to... Uh, drugs, that is, they commit suicide. Mm -hmm. They've gone through all kinds of rehabilitation programs and they fight really hard to, uh, uh, to resist, but in the end, uh, they become so overwhelmed, they give up and commit suicide. Would you speak to that, how dangerous becoming an addict is? And, and even though one tries very hard, that in some cases they become slaves to the process and mm -hmm. end in a tragedy? Oh. I'll, I'll share a little bit of my own personal convictions okay. and beliefs there in that um, I personally prescribe to the, the Bible and uh, to the Christian worldview uh, in regards to relationships and our purpose in life. And uh, I see the Bible reflecting to me um, a, um, an issue where we are created in God's image to have a personal relationship with Him. Without that personal relationship, there's a hole in our heart and in our soul. And we try and fill it with anything and everything. Thus, you can see addictions in every realm. Work, workaholics, you know, drugs, sexuality, um, even religiosity can be an addiction that I think is probably more uh, detrimental to society than anything else. But we don't see it. It's like it's a silent issue. Um, so, you know, addiction... We're made, I believe, to be dependent, but not upon things, not upon issues that give us highs that destroy us. And right now, this methamphetamine thing is something that just frightens me because it's far more deadly than, than any other drug I've seen. But it and, is. Uh, I've talked to some uh, judges and prosecutors, and, hmm. and I guess it's very easy to, uh, to make, and it's, it's more accessible than some drugs. Very much so. Yeah. 
very much so. And you know the thing too is uh, marijuana. Uh, marijuana to me now more and more is becoming like alcohol uh, in the past in that it's, uh, it's not legal and it's not so socially acceptable as alcohol, but it seems to be becoming more socially acceptable and available and it's so much more potent. I've never had kids tell me, uh, you know, prior to about nine or ten years ago that marijuana is addictive. Well, yes, it is. Because it, it, the stuff now that they smoke is just way too powerful. Janelle Bird. Wow. <laughs> um, we've talked about a lot of things, but I, I do know that one of the, the goals is to reunite families when they can be reunited. And I want to give you a little opportunity to talk about that. Um, uh, can families be reunited? And what's necessary in order to get that accomplished? Well, I believe the responsibility, of par uh, for the most part, uh, with parents reuniting with their children and reestablishing a stronger relationship falls on the parents. Um, but I don't work as much with the parents as I do the young people. However, what I've seen is that when young people come to understand an adult, a parent's viewpoint through our discussions, um, see that light go on and they go back home much more appreciative and wanting that involvement. Not as much as I'd like to see, but then I don't see it all. However, that does happen. So. I tell young people, your life at this point is your responsibility. How are you going to react? You need to look at it from a little different viewpoint. You know, exercise that empathy. Um, so with the justice system, uh, I'm so appreciative of uh, probation and diversion and detention center in that they offer a lot of those life skills that help. On that note, I have to bring the program to conclusion. We're out of time, Janelle. I wish we could continue. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, our guest has been Jeff Cheeseborough who is a chaplain with the Kootenai County, Idaho Juvenile Justice Services. And we've been talking, as you know, on the program, what his role is in working with young people and trying to identify some of the problems and, and trying to help young people to become mature adults in the future and to have a, a meaningful and happy life rather than one that is in conflict with society. Uh, Jeff, thank you for being with us. We appreciate it very much. Uh, thank you very much. And good luck to you in your work. Ladies and gentlemen, next week we will change to yet another issue. Uh, at that time, we'll discuss something else that we think is helpful and, and hopefully that you will find of great interest. Until then, uh, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest running entirely college produced program on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us again at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station. <laughs>